from Sobros HQ in Nashville, Tennessee, to wherever you're cheering on your Tennessee Titans. The Sobros Network presents the unofficial Titans Podcast. Welcome back for another episode of the unofficial Titans podcast right here on So Bros Network. Minds right, asses tight, as we are inching closer and closer to the NFL draft. It's your boy, Big Natural Stoney Keeley here. You can follow me on Twitter at Stoney Keeley. Collectively, we are at So Bros Network on all major social media platforms. Joined, as usual, by my co-host for the show. He is Cinderella Man, one take O. Oh. Coming to us from the dad zone, outspoken, Owen Reed. Owen, how are you doing today, my man? Hey, everybody. Hey, Stoney. Uh, it's been a good week. Uh, honestly, my mind is kind of focused on the weekend. Uh, we've got WrestleMania weekend coming. It's mm-hmm. every wrestling fan's biggest weekend. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm getting a lot of wrestling content in this morning. But I am excited to talk about everything that's been going on with the Titans. Man, I I have been I've been doing a little bit of WrestleMania content on the side. I've listed my 40 greatest matches in WrestleMania history. That's up on Sobros Network. The WrestleMania 40 drinking game is up there. I just kind of tweaked and updated my my list of hidden gems in WrestleMania history. That's all up there at Sobros Network. I'm excited for the shows this weekend. I and and I think more than anything I'm I'm starting to get some of that draft fatigue. Like there's just so much work that's been put into this draft <laughs> that I am stoked at the opportunity. I am just going to put my laptop down Saturday and Sunday night, at least for those like six or seven hours or whatever the shows are, and just focus on wrestling right now and and writing like going back through the annals of WrestleMania history is kind of I don't know. It's just getting me in the spirit. It feels like a holiday if you're a wrestling fan. For, so I'm I'm stoked for it. But what do you think of this year's show, man? What do you think of the card that they've put together so far? Man, I love it. It's looking like a banger. I mean, yeah. that tag match, uh, you've got The Rock coming back as advertised. It's 90s heel rock. You've got uh, Cody Rhodes looking to finish the story, a baby face everybody can get behind. Mm-hmm. You have the Tribal Chief. You know, Roman Reigns has been on a tear. He's undeniable. He has Seth Rollins, too, who is also great in his own right. Uh, beyond that, hell of a card. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the 16 ladder match for the tag titles. It's crazy. Uh, I think it's shape, shaping up to be a great show. Yeah, I do too. And I'm, I'm stoked as a longtime fan of Sami Zayn. And I think Gunther might be my favorite wrestler on the planet right now. That IC title match. And especially, I don't know. I didn't watch Monday night, but if they, if they somehow like finagle Chad Gable into that thing and make it a triple threat or something, <laughs> Oh, dude, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be doing cartwheels for that one. But also, I'm I feel like people are kind of low key sleeping on on the the WrestleMania season that Drew McIntyre is having right now too. This dude is just bodying guys on Twitter, and uh, I think him and Seth are gonna put on a pretty good show on Sunday night as well. You got Logan Paul with the U.S. title match. I mean, you know, the only thing that I think they're they're missing on this card. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't feel like they have like the celebrity match this year. You know, I could see that. You do have Logan Paul, but he's kind of been a regular guy. He's kind of yeah. uh, proven himself past that point. Uh, but, you know, there's always surprises. They've announced Lil Wayne's going to be there. And as a boy that grew up on the Carter Three, uh, I couldn't be more excited. So, you know, maybe there will be a surprise. Do you uh, do you have any plans for the show? Like, I, I'm, I'm making an effort to not make plans for the show. I want to sit in my recliner and prop my feet up. Or... I might fill up my foot bath with some hot water and Epsom salt and soak my feet while I'm watching the show too. That's, that's my vision for this weekend. What do you have going on? Well, me and my buddies, uh, we always try to get together at least for the big pay-per-views. Uh, my good brothers, we're meeting up for brother mania night one and night two. Nice. Uh, we're going to, you know, watch some wrestling. We're going to watch the good brother halftime show. I'm looking forward to it. It's always a good time when I see my brothers. Brother Mania is running wild. I am I am happy to hear it. Uh, like you said, though, we do have some Titans stuff to talk about on the unofficial Titans podcast. So let's let's get into it. I want to lead this week's episode with the Legereus Need press conference. He had some media availability early on in the week. 
I really liked what he had to say from a um, like just a, a, a player perspective. He talked about setting goals for himself every year, and last year his goal was to go out there and follow the top guy. He talked about the importance of eliminating an offense's top weapon and how if you can do that, it has a sort of exponential impact on the defense. It makes everybody else's job easier, and it forces the offense to do things that might be out of character, not something that they typically like doing. If you have read my draft coverage at all, I'm a sucker for fluid hips and a cornerback. And he mentioned that specifically as a strength of his like fluid hips, baby. I'm like, Oh hell yeah, there we go. I'm, I got to use that on the podcast and be sure to remind people of that. But I really liked his, his media availability. I talked about it a little bit with Zach Lyons on a uh, football and other F words yesterday as well. But I just kind of want to get your impressions of Legereus Sneed, new Titans cornerback and, your confidence in this secondary now with with Cheeto and Roger McCreary still in the conversation as well. What do you what did you think of Sneed's media availability? Yes, yeah, so uh just as far as personality wise goes, Sneed came off really kind of uh I don't want to say plain, but matter of fact with his an- uh answers to questions. Yeah. You know, they brought up uh the knee and he was kind of, you know, he said, I know how to work with it. I don't miss games. Mm-hmm. Uh I figured out that process. And it's good to go. Uh, so it, it kind of seemed like he was just very matter of fact, ready to work. Uh, uh, you know, and it, it was a good confidence instiller as far as I felt. Yeah. So what's what's your worry level like about that knee? Because I I hear him talk about it, and I'm just looking at the um, looking at the data, the information we have. I, I, he didn't miss games, and when he was playing, it didn't look like the knee was was a problem at all. Uh, hearing him talk about it, knowing that the Titans, I'm assuming, did their due diligence and feel comfortable giving the guy a $19 million a year contract, I'm not really worried about the knee, but how do you, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I kind of feel like uh, those kind of things get blown up in the media. I think when you get to that level of the NFL, this is his – fifth year in, if I'm right, coming mm-hmm. up. Yeah. Class of 20, 2020, 2020. I think, uh, you know, people are going to have, there's players with back issues, knee issues. Uh, but like you said, the productivity hasn't stopped, you know, uh, yeah. was consistently in games, uh, didn't sit out. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's a non-factor, but it kind of seems like something that he has under his control uh, and with his confidence, I feel confident. Yep, I, I'm with it, man. And I think you can you can pretty easily argue that Snead has just gotten better with every year in the NFL. So I I feel like you're catching a guy in his prime. The window's open. I think there are outs in the contract where if you if you had to get out of the deal within a couple of years, you can do that, and it's not going to kill you as a franchise. Like I, I'm just I'm really happy that the Titans went out there and got him. And there's just, there's been this conversation about the Titans getting blue chip players in the draft. Let's not sleep on the fact that they're getting blue chip players in free agency too. And and I would consider Snead, you know, maybe I don't think it's unreasonable to say he's one of the five best cornerbacks in the league. You might have him at one or two, depending on what you value in a cornerback. And if you look at his production against wide receiver ones in the league, Man, I'm just stoked to have the guy here, and and we'll we'll see how how things go. But as far as the secondary going from a blatant weakness in 2023 to potentially a strength in 2024, this group on paper between Sneed, Cheeto, and Roger McCreary looks like on paper again specifying that this could be the greatest trio of cornerbacks that the Titans have ever had here in Nashville. And and I'm hard pressed to think of a better group. Where do, where do you stand on on that conversation, Owen? Because they really flipped they really flipped this cornerback group in in a matter of a season. Now, where where do you think it ranks? Like, do you expect this to be one of the better groups the Titans have ever fielded? I, I absolutely agree with you. I think uh, the narrative throughout the past couple of seasons was that the Titans are a really strong defensive line. Uh, but when it came to secondary, we got passed all over. Uh, yeah. People got frustrated with this just uh, 
trial by numbers. Like we're going to just keep throwing cornerbacks out there and seeing what works. So like you said, with these blue chip prospects, uh, with Sneed, with Cheeto, uh, I I think you're really showing that, uh, you're prioritizing it and that you've got guys out there that are going to consistently play well. What do you think it says about Rand Carthon as a general manager that one of the first things Sneed says when he gets up there is that Rand Carthon made him feel welcome. He he immediately felt like he was wanted here. Well, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why he was hired. You know, they talked about his time with the 49ers, that, that he was just a really a player's kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, we saw times when, uh, maybe free agency wasn't our best strength. Uh, and I think that finding a guy that can go out there and recruit and that can make, you know, these big signings, uh, that's what you want as a Titans fan. That's what you want to see out of the GM. Yeah, man. I'm glad you said recruit. I think that's a great word um, t- to use here with Rand because I'm reminded of the fact that the 49ers sent Rand Carthon when he wasn't even the GM. They sent Rand Carthon to Debo Samuel to smooth that situation over and get that deal done. Like, I, I love it because I think, you know, broadening our scope from football in general, like relationship building is such an important life skill and it translates no matter what profession you're in. And I think stuff like this amounts to evidence that Rand Carthon is a really good relationship builder. And like you said, I think it bodes well for his trajectory as the general manager of the Titans. Now, I do think it's interesting because in that media availability, it kind of sounded like when Rand Carthon spoke, it kind of sounds like they were pivoting from free agency a little bit. Like maybe they had, you know, acknowledged or accepted the fact that, okay, maybe the first wave is over and we got to kind of see how the next few weeks are going to go with the draft before we keep paying players. Do you think that's, do you think that's fair to say? I mean, do you think it is kind of time to say, okay, we've checked the big boxes, but now we've really got three weeks to hone in on this draft and, and get our focus in order there. You know, I just, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Uh, maybe it's uh, the narrative that Rand's putting out there, uh, but mm. I just don't see uh, the recruitment process as we're calling it being over yet. I think, uh, I could be misspeaking here, but uh, Debo Samuel is still looking to get that contract done with the Niners, and it hadn't happened yet. Am I right? Uh, no, he got – I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry, Ayuk. Ayuk, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I knew I'd get there eventually. I was about to say, uh, wait, a se- I, wait a second now. I <laughs> Did I just completely I, misspeak <laughs> and they haven't gotten nope. the Debo deal done? Nope, just outspoken and throwing out half ideas that he has. Uh, sorry, yeah. Brandon I is one one of those guys that's just not quite locked down yet. I think there's still opportunities there. We saw that uh, with trades that have been going on lately. I don't think free agency is over. I do think they have a strong focus on what's going on uh, headed into the draft, but I don't think that uh, that window is closed yet. Maybe maybe it was a situation, Rand's floating it out there like, hey, guys, stop sniffing around Justin Simmons. We want him, but, but don't worry. We're not looking. We're not going to take Justin Simmons. We're focused on the draft right now. And then next week, the Titans announce that they've signed Justin Simmons to come play safety. Just, just you know, let's put our tinfoil hats on there for a minute. So let's say that the Titans are done adding uh, inside linebacker help right now. I thought Rand mentioned something really interesting in his media availability about the green dot responsibilities for the linebacker. And it doesn't have to be a linebacker that wears the green dot and communicates all the time. And it got me thinking of about like the state of this roster and kind of where it's at right now. And if they don't end up adding more uh, veterans to compete for starting jobs, kind of how we feel about it. And if that were to happen, I feel like Elijah Molden would be the starting safety next to Amani Hooker. And just worst case scenario, just talking about like the depth of this roster and where they're at and rebuilding it from a personnel standpoint. Are you good with it? If Elijah Molden is the starting safety next to Amani Hooker come the, come the season starting. 
Yeah, I think uh, the important thing that you said in there was that it, it is still in a rebuild process. Uh, it was not where we wanted it last year uh, for, by any means. Uh, you know, Molden's not the guy that, you know, is that, that star signing that you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that to the point where they're at now, uh, I think you could safely say you feel comfortable with it. Yeah, and I, I think there is a layer of it. I personally don't feel like the inside linebacker position is as devalued as the the general consensus seems to believe, because I think if you can nail that position, it unlocks a lot of what you can do on defense. Like I, I guarantee you the San Francisco 49ers are happy to have Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw, but I will at least concede and meet the, uh, the linebacker doesn't matter crowd halfway in the sense that if you are rebuilding your defense, Basically, from the ground up, I think edge rusher, defensive line, and cornerback are all definitely more pressing, urgent needs. And I do feel like they've at least they've they've checked the cornerback box off completely, if you ask me. So I I do think that at least if you are going to have these deficiencies because you can't get to everything in one off season, at least they are at linebacker and safety. And I still think that there is a relatively high ceiling for Elijah Molden in this league. I think they're probably going to add some bodies in the draft. I think they might add another veteran free agent, but I still think that there is a role depth wise for Elijah Molden on this team. So I'm, I'm kind of cool with that. I similar vein. I want to talk about the offensive line a little bit because I do think that this would be a great draft to go out and get two offensive tackles. I think you can get, your, your two starters in this draft, whether it's Joe Alt in the first and Christian Jones in the fourth or some sort of other amalgamation of these guys. I'm at 22 offensive tackles evaluated at this point. And, and we're, we're talking like I'm at least like 15 or 16 deep with guys that I think could start in the league. So it's a really good loaded tackle class, but there's been an idea that's just been casually floated around out there. And Zach and I talked about it in depth on football and other F words, but I want to get your opinion on it. This worst case scenario situation where maybe the dominoes just simply don't fall the way the Titans want them to. There aren't many quality options in free agency left. Maybe they miss out on Joe Walt. The chargers draft him at fifth overall and they don't get their guy. So they pivot to wide receiver in the first round and then you, you're kind of stuck trying to, to mold something out of a left tackle in the second round. A million different scenarios that can go on, but it kind of sounds like from what we've heard uh, from Rand Carthon's media availability, from Brian Callahan's media availability, they're kind of planting the seeds that there could be a, a, a camp battle between Jalen Duncan and Nicholas petit Frere for that right tackle spot. And I just kind of want to get your sense on – if that were the worst case scenario, what's your confidence level like in Bill Callahan being able to get both of these guys to where they can hold down the fort at right tackle until the position can be uh, addressed further? What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, Tony, I just I don't know if that's once again another narrative being put out there. Uh, I do know that you know Bill Callahan's one of the best coaches that you could possibly have when it comes to that O-line, but I don't know if it's enough to make uh, Duncan or NPF uh, one of those guys where it's just a solid anchor spot. I think that with all the needs that you met in free agency, that you're kind of setting up your draft to be that spot filler Mm. uh, with that number seven overall pick. Uh, Just from the way that it looks, uh, I just, I, I don't know if that's, if it comes down to it, yeah, that, those are your options. That's what you have. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I just, I don't think that that's something that you would want to bank on. Fair enough. Fair enough. Are you, are you ready to give up on Jalen Duncan? I mean, I still like the traits quite a bit, and I kind of want to see what he can do with a guy that some have called the greatest offensive line coach of all time. Like, I kind of want to see what he can get out of him before I'm re- ready to really wave the white flag on Jalen Duncan. But what do you think about his development and where he's at and how he fits into this whole thing? I'm also not in a spot where I think that we give up on Duncan at all, but he's also not that guy that you can bank on yet. So yeah. 
with that question mark, you know, you just you don't know what you got until you develop it with this team. Uh, you know, there's no reason to throw them out, but it's just not a spot where you feel comfortable yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Trey wrote an excellent piece on stacking the inbox this morning. The headline reads the Titans and the new AFC South. He's kind of looking at how all the dominoes have fallen in this division and how active the Houston Texans have been. And even the Jaguars to a certain extent, like everything that has changed in recent years with the Indianapolis Colts and the Titans loading up around Will Levis. And uh, it, it's it's a free piece, so you guys can go to stackingtheinbox.com and read that one for free. You don't need the premium membership to read it. Love Trey's work. Trey's a great writer, and um, stoked that he's on the team with us there. We got a pretty good one, two, three punch going on Stacking the Inbox. So I kind of wanted to bring that conversation to the Unofficial Titans podcast today, Owen, and, and talk to you about it because... It, it wasn't too long ago that the AFC South was the, the laughing stock of the NFL and uh, the Titans were really able to capitalize on that under Mike Vrabel. Really good run, but man, it, it really to me seems like last offseason was a sort of turning point for this division when the Titans, the Texans, and the Colts all rolled the dice on potential franchise quarterbacks in C.J. Stroud, who had a historic rookie season, Will Levis with the Titans, of course, and Anthony Richardson with the Colts. The Jags are kind of in that window right now of of being competitive. You know, I I personally thought they were a little overhyped going into last season, and I kind of think that they could uh, they could be. I think they could be pretty bad in 2024, but I I kind of feel like as far as the Texans, the Colts, and the Titans go things have kind of shifted to where all three of these franchises are on the upswing right now. And I don't think with all these guys on rookie deals and, you know, I mean, at least the Texans and Titans kind of going all in to, to build around their quarterback. I don't know what the Colts are doing in free agency. They've had two big signings and, you know, it's whatever. There's got to be a vision there, I guess. But these three franchises in particular kind of gearing up for the future run, I think they could be I think this could be a pretty tight, fun division to watch over the next couple of years, but how do you see the the free agent moves that the Texans are making? How do you see those those playing out? I mean, does does the trade for Stefan Diggs really move the needle for you? Uh let me just say first, uh you sent me that article this morning and I thought it was very well written. Uh stacking the inboxes, uh Another great source just to get that Titans material out there. I was excited to read that uh, he was playing Red Dead Redemption 2. That's one of my favorite games. <laughs> shout out, Trey. <laughs> uh, shout out, Trey. Great article, great game. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's, it's ex- exciting to see. You know, the Texans already had that strong run last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think just the moves like getting Diggs and getting Hunter uh, really do kind of establish them as – wanting to make that next step and go even further. I think they're, oh, yeah. they, they are the AFC South team to watch for this year. And that hurts my heart to say, yeah, I'm, uh, as a lifelong Texans hater. <laughs> yeah. I'm I can't say lifelong. They're barely a franchise, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I digress. I, I'm with you. Um, the digs trade, man, I, you know, I, I don't want to say that he's he's washed by any stretch of the imagination because, uh, you know, some people, the, the fun joke was, uh, oh, man, I can't remember who tweeted it, but, you know, the Texans fleeced the, um, the Bills brought to you by the same people that produced the Titans fleeced the Falcons <laughs> in reference to all the hype that the Julio Jones trade had a couple of summers ago. I don't think Diggs is at a point in his career that Julio Jones was at in his career when the Titans traded for him. I think there is some good football left, but I I just, it doesn't move the needle in terms of expectations for me because I'm, I'm really high on Nico Collins. I think he's the best receiver that that team has. And I think Tank Dell may be the best overall weapon that they have the way Bobby Slowick schemes him around to get open. I kind of feel like Diggs is just, icing on the cake like they're really just trying to do what they can to stockpile talent around cj stroud but i don't think he's going to be the team's number one i was already pretty high on the texans 
going all in on, on CJ Stroud this year uh, before they traded for Diggs, and I'm kind of at the same spot. So I'm I'm with you. I kind of feel like they're the team to beat in the AFC South. I mean, obviously they're the reigning AFC South champions, but I I don't think that this move like puts them over the top and makes them a Super Bowl contender the way that some people are saying, because I think, I think Diggs is a, a different receiver than he was a couple of years ago. So interesting that we, we kind of sound like we're on the, uh, the same page there. Okay. Let's, let's get to the listener questions. Cause we have, we have quite a few of them again. Let's start with producer Eldon. Hell yeah. We'll start with producer Eldon basically writing our show for us uh, as he does. Okay, the first question. In your opinion, what is the best indicator for what you look for when analyzing whether an offensive lineman is going to make it in the NFL, specifically for later round guys? I think for me, when I'm evaluating offensive linemen, it's a... I think it, it's a layered thing. Like at a basic level, I want to see them winning reps. If they can win reps, just flat out, no matter how, let's just count them wins and losses. If they're winning reps, I think that's something to build off of. But if they're struggling at, at that level of competition, and I think the Yale left tackle, Karan Amagaji, is a great example of that. If he's in the Ivy League going up against Dartmouth and he's not – overpowering guys that are going to be lawyers and accountants in, in a couple of months. I don't know what you build off of other than just the raw traits. So I don't particularly like that. And that's kind of the basis when I'm looking at these late round flyers, if they are winning reps and the tape is, is pretty good. I'm looking at what is it? Is it because of technique? Is it because of just raw talent? And if it's because of technique, I'm looking at it like, okay, that's something that is going to translate at the NFL level. If they already have that level of nuance to their game, I'm I'm good with it. So I don't know if you want to weigh in on evaluating offensive late round offensive linemen, Owen, but the floor is yours if you do. Yeah, I don't know. Big <laughs> hands and a firm ass. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Um Rank the following, summer, winter, spring, and fall. Ooh, I like this one. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go first, uh, since you had the expertise on the last one. I'm going to uh, go spring, fall, summer, winter. And winter's a – there's a big gap between summer and winter. Yeah. I, you know, I'll say I used to hate winter, but the last couple of years I have been um, – getting a lot deeper into my NFL draft coverage. And I've had the senior bowl right there that first week of February, that last week of January, that has kind of given me something to look forward to. And I will say that it has helped me kind of beat the winter blues the last couple of years. So I'm going fall. Fall is my favorite season and then summer and then winter and then spring. I, the spring, wow, spring is a dead last. Spring, spring frustrates me so bad, man. I, I mean, it really does. Like by the time fall comes around, we're like looking for the relief from the heat. So, but we're used to it. So I don't really mind. I don't really mind going from hot to cool occasionally and kind of easing into the winter, but it drives my sinuses nuts when we do the inverse, when it's been cold my body finally gets used to it, and then boom, here's a 75-degree day, and your sinuses are going to be fucked up for the next week while we're at it. So that's why spring's pretty, and, and I have fond memories of spring growing up, but it just destroys my sinuses, so I can't, I can't, can't deal with it. Does Kyle Phillips have a chance to make the Titans roster as it is currently <laughs> constructed without contributing on special teams based on Callahan's tendency to rely on bigger receivers for his offense? This is a really interesting question, Owen. You have, have any thoughts on Kyle Phillips? Yeah, man, I don't know. Tennessee has their thing for white wide receivers, so there's always a chance. <laughs> yeah. um, but that being said, I mean, I think, uh, you know, production has kind of fallen off with them, and uh, mm -hmm. it, w it wasn't necessarily a stretch to have them there, but – it's definitely a stretch to keep them around season after season. And as that name keeps coming up, you kind of see the 
Titans want to uh, develop guys who go into a specific direction. I just don't know if he'll keep up. Yep, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of right there with you. I think he's a good guy to have in camp. I think he's a pretty good route runner. I think injuries are a concern with him too. I know there's there there are people out there that are concerned about his frame and how he holds up in the NFL. And I think you know to be fair, I think there's something to that. I didn't at first, but after seeing how the last season has unfolded, I think it's fair to question his durability. And to Eldon's point, when you look at what the Bengals did with their wide receiving core. I think he just prefers a bigger guy. And I think Kyle Phillips is a guy that could be the odd man out. Once we, we add some numbers to this wide receiver room and see how it shakes down over the summer. I would not be surprised at all. If, if Phillips were to get cut, to be honest with you, I I do think he is a, a, a pretty, he's a fringe candidate because of his size and his injury history. So I don't know, depending, check in a few weeks, Eldon, whenever we've got the draft in our rearview mirror, and we'll see what they've added. And I might say that uh, I, I don't think Kyle Phillips is going to make this roster, but as it's currently constructed, I at least give him a, 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 a puncher's chance to make this group. All right, we're going to go deep into the the cornerback group. This We're still on Eldon. We got like five more from Eldon, too. <laughs> With the new additions of cornerbacks this offseason – uh, speaking of Cheeto and Sneed, what is the likelihood that they draft a cornerback in the later rounds? And assuming they do, which of the following has the best chance to stay on the team? Can be multiple people here too. And which is gone? And he lists Caleb Farley, Anthony Kendall, Eric Guerra, and Trey Avery. I'll go first on this one. Um, I kind of feel like Caleb Farley is a lost cause at this point. I kind of feel like he's gone no matter what I man, I, I feel bad for Trey Avery because Trey Avery is kind of a scapegoat and there have been times that he's looked completely lost, but keep in mind, this is an undrafted free agent. Keep in mind that this was a guy (laughs) that when they brought him to camp, he was coming off of one of the worst analytics graded cornerback seasons we've seen in college football. It's not like this guy had a pedigree. So for them to squeeze any juice out of Trey Avery at all has been really impressive. And I I would look at that. I would look at Avery as a glass half full kind of guy. And I think I would want to keep him around. Eric Gehrer and Anthony Kendall, I, I think Zach and I have talked about this. We talked about it actually in our car ride home from Mobile, Alabama. Six hours of just straight football talk, by the way, for those of you wondering. Like barely barely able to catch our breaths. And we're looking at like kind of putting the pieces together from what the Bengals have drafted under Brian Callahan. And I think the, the general idea is I feel like Brian Callahan likes guys that have had experience at big programs. Now, both Kendall and Garrett got some experience in the NFL last season as, as rookies. And I think Gare had some moments, but I don't feel like they're going to be as high on the pecking order under Brian Callahan as they were under Mike Vrabel. And I, I kind of feel like they could be, I kind of feel like you could be looking at three of these guys being out and it's Farley, Kendall and Gare. I would be willing to to bring Trey Avery back and see how he holds up during camp but I think they're going to make an effort to bring in a different style of cornerback. I think they're probably going to draft a guy in the later rounds, and I think they're probably going to bring in a slew of undrafted guys that fit their criteria a little bit more. But I think they've shown us in free agency that they're they're willing to overhaul this position completely, and they're looking for a different style of cornerback than we've seen on the Titans under Shane Bowen and Mike Vrabel. What do you think of Eldon's question here about this this particular cornerback group, kind of on the back end of what they have now on the depth chart? Yeah, I think you said it really well. I don't think you uh, benefit from cutting Farley necessarily. Uh, Fair enough. It might it might cost you money, uh, but the experiment is definitely a failed one. Uh, it just has not paid out. Uh, yeah, poor Trey Avery, just from undrafted free agent to. Hey, you got to go out here and do the damn thing. We need you now. We need you one on one with with Jamar Chase out here. Welcome to the NFL. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think maybe he'll benefit. You know, he has a chance to grow with, uh, you know, a solid CB one and CB two. Yeah, uh, locked in there. 
Uh, so I think there's a chance there. Uh, and same with the the other two. It, it, they're just kind of – they were spots to fill a roster. And it doesn't sound like a nice thing to say, but they weren't guys that you were going to build around. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I could, I could see three out of the four go easily. If no other running back moves are made, does Hassan Haskins – man, I forget Hassan Haskins is still <laughs> even a thing right now. Does Hassan Haskins make this roster – I say no, Owen, because Hassan Haskins is not the versatile do-it-all kind of running back that it seems like Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon covet in Tajay Spears and Tony Pollard. I think there are going to be other running back moves made, and I don't think Hassan Haskins I, – I, I don't think he's on this roster at all in 2024. Where do you think about his, his draft or his, his stock with this franchise right now? Yeah, I'm with you. With Spears and Pollard, they kind of set the tone for what they're looking for, and Haskins doesn't really fit that narrative. I don't think he uh, clears the changing of the guard. Speaking of guard, what a segue there, and you didn't even realize you did it. It's seemingly nice. clearer that right guard is likely going to be a battle between Brunskill and Raidens. Does it stay that way, and if so, who wins that battle? I don't think so. I think they're going to add a guard in the draft. I think they, they want more um, bigger bodies, and I think that might not bode well for Daniel Brunskill. I wouldn't be surprised if Brunskill kind of kicked inside and they they leaned into his potential as a center, and maybe he backs up Lloyd Cushenberry. I also, I don't know if I've said this before, but I, I also wouldn't be surprised if Brunskill was kind of a surprise cut. Um, I, I think if it's those two, I think it's Raiden's. And I think they see him as a right guard. They've said publicly that he's. they see him as a guard. But I think they're going to add some competition in the draft, whether that's a guy like, I, I don't know, Layden Robinson out of Texas A&M off the top of my head, a Bo Lemmer. I think Bo Lemmer would, would cost quite a bit of draft capital, the, the guy from Arkansas who's being projected as a center. I like his tape at guard better. You get, you get, wins, at Will, you get wins against Will Anderson in, in Alabama – that 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 checks a huge box for me with Bo Limmer. So I like him. I think it's a good interior offensive line class. I think they're going to look to add somebody. They've already added Sadiq Charles. I think he could be kind of insurance on at a number of different positions. So I, I think Raidens is probably the guy now, but I don't think it stays Raidens versus Brunskill um, for, for much longer. What do you think about that one, Owen? Once again with you, I feel like uh, Brunskill and Raidens are both kind of the ghosts of uh, Titans past where we just kind of filled spots with bodies. Uh, doesn't seem like the route that this current uh, Titans franchise wants to go. Uh, I definitely could see somebody coming in in the draft. If the linebacker position ends up being what it is today, is Otis Reese technically sound enough to wear the green dot with Murray by his side, or you do, or do you think that Doctor Gibby ends up with it? I, man, I don't know who the odd man out is going to be because all three of those linebackers played the role next to Aziz Alshire last year, where. When you sub in like a, a slot corner, that linebacker is the one that comes off the field. So if you've got three of those guys that come off the field when you need an extra DB in coverage, they can't they can't wear the green dot because they're not on the field long enough. So I don't know who I don't know who that's that's going to be. Uh, to me, I don't think. Man, I think you're really reaching. If I and I like Otis Reese, I, I like him as a developmental guy. I don't think he's ready for that spot yet. And I think Jack Gibbons has shown that I don't think he's that guy either. And I don't know what the plan is with Kenneth Murray, who they signed. Like I'm, I am still just completely baffled by the linebacker group right now. I think if this were the case and the linebacker position ends up being what it is today, I think we might see that situation uh, that Rand Carthon alluded to in his press conference on Monday, where maybe you put the green dot on Amani Hooker and Elijah Molden, and maybe one of those guys is the guy that's communicating the plays and everything out there, which is the the primary responsibility of the green dot linebacker. But what do you think about this one, and, and what's your level of confidence in, in Otis Reese and Jack Gibbons being difference makers at the linebacker spot? Uh, absolutely. Uh, 
No, it seems like it's absolutely up in the air. Uh, I don't feel like either of those are your green dot guys. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just doesn't seem like a position that they're going in with confidence. Fair enough. Yeah, we're in agreement there as well. Last question from producer Eldon, who basically writes our show for us. Who do you have in a cage match between a Siberian tiger and a grizzly bear? I think that people just underestimate bears so much. Hell yeah. Uh, the, the, it's the size, the speed. Uh, it, it, they're a tank with fur that can just reach upwards of incredible speeds. Uh, I'm going to go grizzly bear. I'm with you. I mean, I, I'm with you. I think people underestimate bears in general as well. I'm so glad you said that. No notes. No notes for me. 10 out of 10. And thank you for all your questions, Eldon. We do appreciate it. We were talking about it before the Hell show. Yeah, we're buddy. like, man, makes our job easier whenever we get so many questions like that. Um, moving on to Daniel's question. This is a very specific situation that I hope I hope does not happen. <laughs> but he says the first six picks go Chicago, Caleb Williams, Washington, Drake May, New England, Joe Alt, Arizona, Marvin Harrison Jr., Los Angeles, J.C. Latham, New York, Malik Neighbors. So basically only two quarterbacks go in the first six picks. He asked, what are you doing at seven? I, man, it, it's, it's a cop-out, but if they're in a spot where they can trade back and accumulate draft picks, I'm going with that route. But if we're sticking and picking at seven, I don't think that I have a problem with this team going Olu Fashinu there and just getting the second best tackle, or at least in my opinion, the second best tackle in this draft class there. Really good pass protector. I think the exponential impact that securing that left tackle spot has on the rest of your offense is is super important. That is probably what I I would do, but I also think Roma Dunze, the wide receiver out of Washington, is the best prospect in this draft class, period. So I wouldn't be complaining if they added another electric wide receiver and maybe got some long-term insurance at the position as well. But what do you think if that's the case and you have Harrison Jr., all Latham and neighbors gone and only two of the quarterbacks go in the first six picks, what are you thinking, Owen? What are you, what are you, what's your preference there in that spot? Yeah. I mean, just to answer the question based on the scenario, uh, Fashionu was the first name that came to my mind, just as cool. our next best option up. But I just, I really don't see that happening. I think there's, you know, just so much clamor to move up and grab the first four quarterbacks uh, that I just, I don't see where we get to seven and there, and only two have gone. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. I, I think that if that were the case, I think it would be a really surprise. I think it'd be a big surprise for, you know, a lot of people seem to think four quarterbacks are going top seven. I think it would be a surprise if at least three didn't go and somebody didn't go for Jaden Daniels out of LSU with one of those picks as well. But that is a scenario that, like I said, I kind of, I don't want to see, I don't even want to think about that, Daniel. I kind of hate that you asked us that question. I don't even want to think about that right now. Um, Kenneth asks us draft question for Stoney, which draft prospects will you flip chairs for one chair flipped in excitement, one chair flipped in anger. I'm going to go deep cut with the excitement. I'm going to go with Georgia state left tackle Travis Glover, because I think he's a guy that, that has the tools. Uh, I, I will be ecstatic if they get him. He's a day three guy, developmental prospect for sure. But he's a guy that I really want to see, get a chance in the NFL and to work with Bill Callahan and to come in, maybe he's not the answer at left tackle, but man, I, I would be stoked. I, I would be really excited. He's one of my guys in this draft class and I, um, just raw emotion. I think I would be like, hell yeah. And then I'd also say, damn, they must be subscribed to stacking the inbox and saw my two hour film breakdown on Travis Glover. So that would be, that would be cool too. As far as flipping a chair in anger, um, man, I think it would be, I think that pick would probably be maybe, I think shit. Now I'm, I should have prepared. I forgot that the, this was a twofold question. I think Karan Amagaji 
the left tackle out of Yale, who I mentioned earlier, I think he's got some really suspect tape. And I think if you're drafting him, you're only drafting him to be – if you're you're only drafting him because of his size and length, I think I would probably flip a table if he ends up on this Titans roster. Okay, fan question for Owen. How do you feel about the offseason the Titans have had? From firing Vrabel to everything since, feels like a roller coaster. It does feel like a roller coaster, but some people like roller coasters. I'm a fan. I just went to Dollywood for the first time two weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, man, just how disappointing last year was. It, it sucked. It was not a fun year to be a Titans fan. And it felt like week after week, uh, just more disappointment set in. So, uh, I think I would be more upset if there weren't a lot of moves, uh, this year. Uh, I, I think that we just can't go back to that. It was so frustrating to watch. So I'm excited with this all season. I think that they filled a lot of needs. There was a lot of holes, and a lot of them have been filled, uh, giggity. But <laughs> uh, I think just from the broad perspective of how it's looked, uh, it, it's something to give you confidence in. Fair enough. Uh, Tyler asks, how do you feel about Peyton Wilson at 38? I think he has the perfect blend of size, speed, and coverage ability to slot in beside Kenneth Murray. Tyler, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Wilson is my top-rated linebacker, inside linebacker in this draft class. I'm not as concerned as the uh, about the injuries as some other people are. I think you know he's he's shown he's had two really good seasons since the ACL tears. I think he's fine. I think he's probably the closest thing to Fred Warner that you're going to find in this draft class. But at 38. Man, I don't know. At 38, with no third-round pick as it stands, might be a little too rich for my blood because you're still going to have big boxes to check in the uh, edge rusher category, the wide receiver category, excuse me, the defensive line category. And I just I, – I don't know about reaching for one of these linebackers at 38. Do you have any any thoughts on, on that, Owen, like – that high of a pick for a linebacker, would you be cool with it if it was the right guy? Yeah, I don't feel like uh, our roster is set enough to be able to make reaches as early as the second round. Uh, I'm with you on that. All right, we got a we got a, a three layer question from Drew Cephas here. Which projected second round receiver would be the best fit for the Titans this year and going forward? Um, honestly, Drew Cephas, there are a few guys that I like in the second round. I'm a huge fan of Ricky Pearsall out of Florida. I think he's miscast as a uh, slot only guy. I think he's capable of playing out wide. I think he, he sells his release with his entire body from his, from his head to his toes. He's got a nasty head whip, good shoulders. It kind of jars guys loose. I think he's got really good athletic traits. I think he could be a player for years to come. I like Xavier Worthy a lot. I don't know if he's going to slip to the second round, but maybe an option for the Titans there at 38. I don't like him as a wide receiver one. And before the Titans signed Calvin Ridley, I would not have been on board with the pick at all. I think he's got an element of pure speed that behind Hopkins and Ridley would be really, really fun to play with. Like I saw a play I don't remember like uh what account it came from but I follow all these accounts that are just like drawing up plays and shit like that and there's a play where you pair like an over and a post route with a wheel route and I'm thinking like man the way these things cross against cover three I'm getting way into the weeds here but like against cover <laughs> three like this thing would be a killer if you had Hopkins on the over Ridley on the post and then you had a guy like Xavier Worthy running into motion and then turning that into a wheel route up the up the field, causing conflict at the third level between the cover three defenders. And, man, like that's the stuff that Bobby Slowick did with Tank Dell to get him open. So a guy like Xavier Worthy with his raw speed as a complement to what Hopkins and Ridley do well, I think that would be pretty exciting as well. Which linebackers in the class excel in coverage? Uh, we've already talked about Peyton Wilson. I also like uh, Junior Colson as well. I think both of those guys are really twitchy, rangy guys. And uh, I would put Jeremiah Trotter Jr. in the category as well. I don't think he has the athletic profile. He's not as explosive or twitchy as the other two guys, but I do like him quite a bit in coverage. 
Last question from from Drew Cephas. What safety alignment does Wilson prefer? Single high, two high, three safeties. Who's the best fit for those roles, uh, free agent or draft? Drew Cephas, I, I ain't going to lie. Like, I haven't even started on the free agent study stuff. It's all draft right now. So I once once the draft happens and we kind of – the dust settles from that, I'm going to be digging into not only the free agent signings that the Titans have made, but I'm also going to go back and watch some Ravens defensive tape and I'm going to watch some Bengals offensive tape and just kind of see if I can pick up clues as as to what this Titans offense and defense might look like. So I don't – I haven't done any, any real study beyond like the surface level stuff of – you know, Mike McDonald crowding the line of scrimmage so that quarterbacks don't know who's dropping and who's rushing. And these uh, cornerbacks that like to play physical man dogs, as Denard Wilson called them. So I, I don't have an answer to, to that one, but um, wanted to ask you, Owen, at least open it up. Like any any of these like second tier wide receivers in this draft class that you're particularly interested in? Buddy, I'm not sure. I'm not a big draft guy. I know that a lot of talk came out about, uh, you know, Xavier worthy speed. That's about, that's yeah. about where it is yeah. for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the draft guy. That's Stony. <laughs> uh, Jay asks us, tell me why Roma Dunze is so overlooked. I think he's a better prospect than all. I want him and Levis connecting on deep balls and red zone fades for year to come. I'm with you, Jay. I, I think Rome is actually the best player in this draft. I have him ranked ahead of Alt as well. And um, the idea of him and Levis connecting on those deep balls is is pretty pretty enticing, if you ask me. And that's why I think it would be hard to pass him up if Alt was off the board and you can't trade back and you're stuck at seven and he's there. I think it would be really hard to pass on him. And I, I wouldn't complain if they if they got him at all. As for... Why he's overlooked, I think, man, I think there's a little bit of, man, it just, the outright speed doesn't show up on his tape. And there were questions about that going into the combine. I think he answered those questions with the athletic testing. He posted a really high RAS. I'm a big fan of that metric. And I think if you actually watch the tape, you'll see a lot of him having to, kind of slow down on a route because Michael Penix Jr. was under throwing a ball. Not like a consistent thing like every every other play, but I I think his tape in 2023 looks a lot different than 2022 and I think a lot of people kind of took that as oh well he took a step back. And they see like the raw physical nature of Malik Neighbors and they see the fine-tuned route running of Marvin Harrison Jr. And the name Marvin Harrison Jr. probably doesn't hurt either. And I think Adunze kind of gets lost in the shuffle. You've heard people say any other year and he'd be the top wide receiver in this class. I think that's probably true. And I've got him as the top receiver in this class anyway. Last question. This comes to us courtesy of The General. Living in New Jersey, I plan to take a road trip with my 17-year-old son this year to catch a game and a long weekend stay not wanting to get caught in tourist traps and need advice for places to eat and stay and capture the local vibe. Owen, any recommendations for the general here? Oh man. I mean, it's always busy. It's always filled up, but if you could ever make a stop at Loveless cafe, it's out of the way. It's not near downtown Nashville, uh, but it's just a really nice, you know, Southern meal. Uh, you know, people are, you know, on and off the hype train with it. But I think it's just uh, a great place to take somebody. You can go over that Natchez uh, Trace, Ooh, yeah. which is just a beautiful drive. Uh, I think that's my suggestion for a good place to go eat that's kind of out of the way and not really uh, stuck with the Broadway Woo Girls. Yeah, and it's a, it's a road trip, so they're going to have the car. Um, nice, little, uh, nice little trip, uh, a taste of Tennessee there. I would say... You know, as much as I hate the touristy stuff, and I'm just a, you know, grizzled old veteran here when it comes to, <laughs> to, to downtown Nashville, I still tell people when they're coming to town, if Broadway's not your thing, you don't have to, don't, don't partake, but I still, I still tell people to stay downtown if you can. You don't have to stay like right in the thick of everything that's happening in Broadway, but it is still pretty cool if you can get a hotel nearby 
to just kind of see the city skyline at night, to see the glow of all the neon from Broadway. I, I still think it's one of those things, General. I don't know if this is your first trip to Nashville. If it is your first trip to Nashville, I would say, you know what? Stay downtown. It goes counterintuitive to everything I say on the Sobros Power Hour, where we talk about all things Nashville. But I, I still think it is something that you need to at least get a glimpse of at least once in your life. As for places to eat, um, man, I think East Nashville is just brimming with fine dining, just great, great options. And I immediately think of like Audrey for a really nice meal. Uh, it is a spot like you're going to need reservations for, but like butcher and B is out there. There's a couple of really good breweries out there. East Nashville beer works, um, good pizza, good spot to get some beers. And, um, I'm trying to think like, and two ten Jack is out there. Uh, Jenny's ice cream. My wife and I are out in East Nashville all the time. So, we can put together maybe a little list and I'll, I'll shoot you a, a DM. Cause I feel like I've got a Google doc somewhere for friends that come in from out of town and be like, these are the places you need to go try. So uh, that's it, Owen. That's we've, we've made it to the end of another unofficial Titans podcast right under an hour. Uh, it's great. Thank you to all the listeners and producer Eldon for basically writing the show for us with your questions. You got any parting shots for us before we get on out of here today? No, man, that's it. I really appreciate uh, the contributions that we get from everybody. It's nice to know people are listening. I enjoy the engagement. Keep them coming. There we go. All right. Well, uh, that's going to do it for us. Once again, you can follow me on Twitter at Stony Keeley. Collectively, we are at Sobros Network. Uh, rate, review, subscribe, the unofficial Titans podcast, wherever you take in your shows. We are out there in these internet streets, baby. We ain't too hard to find. Subscribe to Sobros, the Sobros Substack on stackingtheinbox.com. You get all my draft coverage, my coverage of the Tennessee Titans, and we've also been rolling with Sobros Saturday recently. You got the book club, the Sobros Lounge. There's an episode of Movie Review Rewind up there, an episode of Sports Punch talking about Jamarcus Russell. Uh, this week, there's a new episode of the Movie Review Rewind podcast. Brandon and I are going to be talking about The Cable Guy, uh, Jim Ooh. Carrey in the 90s. $5 a month, great value. You get all of Zach's work. You get all of Trey's work as well. Uh, Stackingtheinbox.com. We're going to get on out of here today. I'm going to get some lunch and uh, prop my feet up, take a quick moment to catch my breath, and then it's back to more film study. Oh, but until next week. He is Cinderella Man, One Take O, Outspoken Owen Reed. I am Big Natural Stony Keeley. And until next time, you stay classy, Titans fans. <laughs> <laughs>